China and the United States reach a climate agreement in Glasgow. The two countries pledge to increase cooperation on climate change, including eventually phasing out the use of coal. And a historic resolution is adopted by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China at the sixth plenary session in Beijing. What the resolution means for the country's next 100 years. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. We will bring you more on the joint declaration from the United States and China on climate change later in the show, but first we begin in Beijing. The sixth plenary session of the 19th CPC Central Committee adopted a communique on Thursday acknowledging China's achievements over the last 100 years. Chinese President Xi Jinping, who is also the General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee, delivered an important speech before members. The resolution points to 10 principles, including upholding the party's leadership, putting the people first, and advancing theoretical innovation and maintaining a global vision. For more, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Tennessee is Joseph Gregory Mahoney. He's a professor of politics at East China Normal University in Shanghai. Also with us is Nesin Mabubi. He's a research scholar with the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. From Israel, John Gong is a professor of economics at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. And Victor Gao is a chair professor at Suchow University in Beijing. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Uh, Victor Gao, for only the third time in China's history, a resolution was adopted by the sixth plenary session of the 19th CPC Central Committee. What can you tell us about this resolution and its significance? Well, first of all, we are very happy that the sixth plenum was successfully concluded yesterday. And the resolution adopted that you mentioned is truly a historical uh, document. It really happened. And this resolution looked back upon the 100 year of history since the founding of the Communist Party of China back in 1921 and summarized all the high achievements that the party made between 1921 to 1949 when the People's Republic of China was founded and then between 1949 all the way to, let's say, 1978 when China decided to open up to the rest of the world and engage in economic and political reform, and especially since 2012, when President Xi Jinping became the party general secretary, unifying the country and the whole nation and the whole party onto new phases of reform and opening to the outside world. His, this historical reflection and summary is very important because it its aim is to look forward into the next years and decades and up to one century further away so that the Chinese nation under the leadership of the Communist Party of China can be more united, more coherent in marching forward to achieve our goal of national rejuvenation for the whole Chinese nation. Joseph Mahoney, uh the host of CGTN's Closer to China, Robert Lawrence Kuhn, he wrote an opinion piece in which he said, in Mao's era, China stood up. In Deng's era, China became rich. This plenum uh, sets the stage for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation with President Xi in charge. What is your takeaway from this communique? And could you explain for us China's goal about achieving this next re rejuvenation? You know, it's been interesting to, to see the hyperbole, uh, misinterpretations being promoted about the resolution in some Western media. Uh, but my perspective is not much different uh, from Robert Kuhn's. It's quite logical, uh, as, as uh, Professor Gao was making clear, that a new resolution on history was coming. China, having reached uh, the development arc of achieving the first 100, uh, the first centenary goal, uh, the, the Xiao Kong Shui, the, the moderately prosperous or moderately well-off society, and uh, President Xi already signaling for several years that China was entering a new era uh, with many new reforms already in place and more to come. Um, that said, I think that the, the, resolu the resolution also emphasizes uh, positive contributions from and continuities between each generation of leadership, with the party indicating more confidence in both its historical past and its current path 
and its prospects for the future. Now, with respect to its, its desire to achieve uh, national rejuvenation, uh, I think the, the, the date that really comes into focus is the second 100. There are other dates that lead up to 2035, uh, for example. But 2049, the second 100, uh, where China hopes to reach the goal of being a fully developed uh, modern socialist nation. Um, and what we're also seeing now is increasingly the term common prosperity being associated with that same period of time, that these, will, that these two will come together and coalesce. And at that point, uh, uh, we might say that China has uh, reached the next major milestone in its national rejuvenation. Nesin Mabubi, how should the world be viewing this communique? Well, I, I do want to agree with the comments that were made earlier that it's quite significant that uh, putting his stamp on the party uh, in this way, um, as only Mao Zedong did in 1945 and Deng Xiaoping did in 1981, uh, is, is quite significant. Um, and it does uh, put uh, Xi Jinping on par um, with those two prior leaders, at least more so than uh, the leaders uh, who preceded him uh, after, after Deng Xiaoping. Um, as to how the world views it, uh, that I, I, I can't uh, say um, that there's a lot to be said, uh, because I do think these kinds of documents, these kinds of meetings, are probably fair to say have much more internal significance with China, within China, the messaging that's sent to the bureaucracy within China um, is, is much more significant than, I think, any external messaging. I think the only external messaging um, that's really significant is that Xi Jinping is in charge, um, that he's likely to stay on for another term, um, if not longer. But that's something that we've known uh, for quite some time, uh, at least since 2018. Um, so in that respect, I think, uh, you know, this, this plenum, this communique, um, is simply uh, reinforcing a message that has already been uh, out there for the rest of the world. John Gong, uh, China is the world's second largest economy, as we are aware. Over the years, China has opened up, it's integrated its economy with the global economy. Uh, what can you tell us about the progress that's been made so far? Well, this communique has said quite a bit about uh, the economic achievement, uh, and uh, particularly the economic achievement uh, amidst the difficulties, amidst the, uh, uh, the diversities associated with the pandemic in the last two years. Um, that has a lot, you know, that enough has been said about you know, all these achievements. But uh, in addition to that, I, I do want to uh, alert to you, Annette, that uh, one very important that is uh, probably uh, most noticeable to the uh, external audience outside of China, that is the issue about Taiwan. I think this is a particularly important um, uh, because I think it is the most important issue between the uh, United States and China. Uh, uh, you know, it's extremely important. Um, and, and there's a small paragraph uh, in, in that document. Um, and I think sometimes it's more important to read, I've been reading between lines, but I think it's more important to look at things that haven't been mentioned as opposed to things that have been mentioned. Um, and I compare this document with respect to the issue of Taiwan with the previous uh, plenary session, that is the fourth plenary session about, about the Taiwan issue. In that document, uh, it mentions, for example, to facilitate exchanges and, and commerce with Taiwan. Uh, for uh, further development of the bilateral relationships on the two sides. Uh, it talks about uh, appealing to the Taiwanese to, 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 uh, to be opposed to the Taiwan independence movement. All of these things are not mentioned at all in this document. Uh, instead, uh, it says that uh, um, you know, China is firmly uh, against uh, the, the Taiwan independence movement. Uh, is firmly against uh, any external interference. Um, and that's a very noticeable change of tone, in my view. And I think it's a, it's a profound, profound adjustment of policy with respect to Taiwan. And I think these people, uh, the policy makers, foreign policy, people in the foreign policy circles in the United States, got to be paying a lot of attention to this change. And I think it bodes... Um, uh, very significant uh, changes ahead uh, in the next few years with respect to the Taiwan issue. 
Nesson Mabubi, one other thing. We've noticed in the past the almost alarm that's expressed by Western nations, particularly the United States, when China has announced its future plans, particularly in technology development. Uh, so when the country talks about national rejuvenation, do you think that gets the attention of people uh, in the United States and in other Western countries? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think some of that uh, rhetoric, uh, some of which uh, is associated with uh, Xi Jinping's administration, um, is sort of priced in at this point. Uh, so I'm not sure that um, repeating uh, these phrases that we've all become accustomed to um, uh, in this in this communique or in the fuller resolution that we're expecting uh, any time um, is going to is going to have uh, that much of an impact. I think maybe you know, as was just said, uh, some of the sort of parsing of uh, certain issues like the Taiwan issue and really comparing the language uh, to prior uh, communiques, uh, maybe that's some room for analysis there. Uh, but otherwise, I don't think that um, the rhetoric, uh, the national rejuvenation rhetoric that we're seeing in this communique will, will strike foreign observers as really all that different from the kind of rhetoric that we've seen uh, in, in recent years. Victor Gao, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, technology developments and technological progress that's been made in China. Uh, the country has been at the forefront of innovation, especially when we look at some sectors like robotics, AI, uh, 5G technology for another. Um, put this in perspective for us. Why are these things so important right now? Well, first of all, allow me to put this in historical uh, perspective. Back in 1978, when China embarked upon the four modernizations, it actually included the modernization of science and technology, because we truly believe that science and technology can really be the most important instrument to emancipate productivity and efficiency and to enable transformation of societies going forward. Coming back to today, I think China is not only the second largest economy in the world, and soon probably will surpass that and become the largest economy in the world uh, in less than 10 years, and the continued growing and expanding economic base with stronger uh, capabilities have also provided the groundwork and the resources to do all kinds of scientific and technological analysis, research, and breakthroughs. And I think the Chinese government's emphasis on innovation, creativity, etc., also enable the Chinese nation to not only do things in a traditional way, but also to always move on to the cutting edge of innovation, entrepreneurship, new way of thinking, new way of doing things. And I think you can see that China has moved into leading positions of many sectors in the world, not only in the sectors you mentioned, AI, for example, telecommunication, 5G, or moving to 6G. China is moving very fast in deep space, deep sea, new energy, new technologies of all kinds. And I think the world will be kept uh, surprised happily to see new initiatives coming out of the big pipeline in China. This is not only good for the Chinese people going forward, it also creates all kinds of opportunities for other countries in the world, because I truly believe the economic development in China is not just for the Chinese people. The size of it, the magnitude of it, will benefit all the other countries which engage with China in a friendly way on an equal basis. So China's economic development, driven by innovation and technological breakthroughs, is a development for the benefit of mankind as a whole. OK, we are going to take a break right now. More of our conversation right after that. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent, find new opportunities, discover a path forward. 
CGTN. See the difference. The world's currencies are more connected than ever before. The mechanisms that drive the economy are universal. Money moves markets. We explain these trends and show you how the cash in your pocket can have a wide-reaching effect. Because money makes the world go round. Global Business. Welcome back to The Heat. We're discussing the CPC Central Committee's passing of a landmark resolution. Let's get back now to our panel. And Joseph Mahoney, I want to start with you, and let's talk about something that we've talked about before on this program, and that is uh, China's poverty alleviation efforts. At the beginning of the year, China announced that it had lifted 100 million people in rural areas out of extreme poverty. What did that take, and how big an achievement was that? You know, I think it's really hard to uh, overstate uh, the, the incredible achievement associated with, with this. And, and not just, you know, lifting, uh, 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 eliminating extreme poverty, but, uh, you know, more than 770 million people lifted out of poverty since 1979, which uh, equals more than 70 percent of world poverty alleviation total over the same period. Now, we know uh, in, in, in the larger context that China's GDP exceeded uh, $15.7 trillion last year, and its per capita GDP now exceeds uh, $10,000. Uh, so uh, if we take this and the fact that now that, uh, now that more than 400 million uh, Chinese are, are middle income earners, uh, at that number that's still growing, that China was the first to uh, emerge from uh, uh, negative to positive growth, uh, that it's the most desirable market uh, to grow in, uh, that it's um, uh, um, uh, the top destination for FDI, all of this uh, uh, is now uh, uh, feeding into um, the um, uh, RCEP coming into force uh, the first of the year. Uh, with, with growth rates already high, um, I think that uh, we're going to see this tremendous uh, forward progress, uh, not just uh, in ways that will help um, um, eliminate the risk of a middle income trap, but also continue to grow and, uh, and, and increase uh, per capita GDP and eliminate all forms of poverty. John Gong, uh, China has also committed to green development since 2017. It's invested close to $400 billion in domestic green technology. And in addition, uh, Beijing has invested $250 billion in global green projects, and that's mainly through its Belt and Road Initiative uh, around the globe. Um, we also know that China is going to be going green for the upcoming uh, Winter Olympics, which takes place early next year. Uh, what can you tell us about all these efforts? Yeah, um, you know, green development uh, and also uh, tackling the issue of climate change, these are all uh, high priorities to President Xi. Um, and, and these are the things that naturally you would expect of a country when it achieves a certain level of the economic development. Um, this is, uh, is we're entering into a stage of quality development. Uh, so environment and climate are very important issues for, for the Chinese people. Um, and I think uh, I think you're going to mention the uh, the bilateral agreement, uh, the joint declaration just signed by United States and China, and that's also another aspect that uh, shows that China's commitment towards that. And I think it's a very significant uh, development, uh, in the sense that uh, at least uh, on this issue, United States and China can sit down together, uh, and, and work together, and uh, and lead the world by example. Uh, and I just hope that, uh, you know, things like that would be uh, uh, spilled over into other areas other than just the climate change. Victor Gao, uh, John Gong just mentioned that joint declaration that was signed by the United States and China on climate change. Uh, this is what the uh, Chinese Special Climate Envoy, Xi Xianhua, had to say. Let's listen. Climate is a common challenge faced by humanity and will impact the well-being of future generations. It's becoming increasingly urgent and severe, turning a future challenge into a crisis happening now. In the area of climate change, there is more agreement between China and the U.S. than divergence, making it an area with huge potential for cooperation. So, Victor, given that there have been growing tensions between these two countries for some time now, um, are you encouraged that they've come out with a, a joint declaration like this? 
Absolutely. A couple of my personal uh, observations. First of all, this uh, joint uh, resolution between China and the United States took place with a lot of happy surprises because the rest of the world didn't seem to know that all this behind the scene private negotiations took place between China and the United States. And when the decision was released, it came as a happy surprise for all those important delegates attending the Glasgow COP26 summit meeting. Why? Because the COP26 negotiations seem to slow down against the general expectation. And all of a sudden, you have this very happy, surprising resolution or cooperation agreement between China and the United States. Now, the significance of this is definitely not restricted to climate change issues, because indeed, on this particular issue, China and the United States have more in common than differences. But the significance is that if China and the United States, despite of their deteriorating relations, can decide to cooperate on a major issue like climate change, why couldn't they muster all their wisdom and courage to focus on differences, overcome the differences, and make sure that they get along with each other, rather than, for example, as some scholars have said, destined to war. Because the other option is the very bad option for China and the United States and for the rest of the world. China and the United States need to get along with each other. They need to live and let live. That gives hope and confidence to people like me that the Chinese government and the United States government and the Chinese people and the American people eventually will decide upon a better choice, better cause of action for their two countries, for the rest of the world, that is to live and let live and get along with each other for the benefit of the whole world. Nathan Mabubi, uh, Victor Gao raises an important important and interesting issue there. Uh, as he says, if the United States and China can cooperate on the climate change issue, why can't they cooperate on other more complex issues as well? And it's something that we also heard from the United States climate envoy, John Kerry, who acknowledged that the fight against climate change is the one issue that the two countries can agree on. This is what John Kerry had to say. The United States and China have no shortage of differences, but on climate, on climate, cooperation is the only way to get this job done. This is not a discretionary thing, frankly. This is science. It's math and physics that dictate the road that we have to travel. So, Nathan, do you think this would open the door, perhaps a little bit, to uh, discussions and perhaps agreements even on other issues? Well, sure. You know, I think that uh, the agreement is primarily important for its larger symbolism. Uh, others have noted that, uh, in fact, John Kerry and Xie Jinhua uh, negotiated a similar agreement in 2014. And if you actually were looking at the content of the two agreements very specifically, there's not a lot in this new agreement that's new. And in fact, the targets uh, in the 2014 agreement were a little bit more precise. Uh, that said, uh, because of the tensions right now between the two countries, I think many observers, uh, including other countries, were not necessarily expecting the U.S. and China to be able to do some kind of a joint statement. And the fact that they were able to do it, notwithstanding all the different things we're seeing uh, in the news about the tensions between the two countries, is, is quite significant. Now, as to whether it will have wider significance, I think one of the things that interests me a lot is that it may primarily be significant because of that exact point. Uh, whether or not the U.S. and China have to be on the same page on climate in order for them to do what they each want to do, regardless of the other, in order to uh, improve their situation uh, in terms of all the negative effects of climate change in the future, I'm not sure. But this idea that's out there that the U.S. and China need to work together on climate actually is serving a purpose of getting them to the table in ways that can have positive spillover effects onto other issues. So actually, I think that is the primary significance of this statement, putting aside the specifics of the content, putting aside whether or not the two countries absolutely have to work together on this issue, the sense that they do is opening up the avenues towards working together on other issues as well.
Joseph Mahoney, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it does send a powerful message, doesn't it, when we have these two countries issuing a joint declaration, and it was, as Victor pointed out, something of a happy surprise. Uh, it may be symbolic in many respects because a lot, of the, a lot of what's in the agreement, of course, these two countries have agreed on before. But at this time, when we saw that COP26 was, in some respects, flagging towards the end, it sent a very good message, didn't it? Well, it provides some optimism, particularly as we head into next week when the two presidents are expected uh, to have a meeting by video link. And we'll have to see uh, what sort of communication comes out of that. But the fact of the matter is uh, relations remain difficult. Um, uh, Biden is still very uh, politically vulnerable with a, a low approval rating, somewhere around 38 percent right now. Um, he's had some uh, moderate success recently with passage of his infrastructure bill. And I think many of us were hoping that that would buy him some political capital for more cooperation with China. Uh, so hopefully this deal on emissions is just the start, that we won't see the pendulum swing negative again uh, next week. You know, every movement, uh, as the saying goes, uh, every movement forward begins with a movement backward. But, you know, Washington owes the world many more steps forward after so much backwardness in recent years. Uh, but again, remember, you know, we've had uh, this difficult year with AUKUS, uh, with, with uh, uh, Washington pushing the Indo-Pacific, with announcements that U.S. troops are in Taiwan, and uh, many other issues. Uh, you know, uh, you pick up U.S. Uh, uh, China Daily today, and you see um, uh, comments about uh, concerns about uh, U.S. congressmen visiting Taiwan and whether or not this is further undermining uh, relations between the two countries. So looking at things in broader context, I think it's still difficult to, to uh, declare that this is really moving forward. But uh, again, uh, I know that uh, both Victor and I have always been optimistic and, and hope for the best when it comes to these matters. John Gong, very quickly, I've got less than a minute left, but one of the big challenges for China will be the shift away from using coal as a source of energy. I mean, the country is committed to going carbon neutral by 2060. How difficult is that going to be? Well, uh, China has already stopped uh, building new coal-powered power plants, uh, coal-fired power plants in China already. Um, and I think it's just a matter of uh, gradually phasing the existing plants uh, over time. Uh, but I think it is indeed a very big deal that uh, I think several weeks ago, President Xi announced to the world that uh, I think it's in that uh, United Nations speech, uh, he said that uh, uh, China will stop sponsoring or stop building any coal-fired power plant for other countries in the Belt and Road Initiative, for, for, for any country for that matter. And I think that's a, that's a very significant development um, because that's indeed a very large industry. And I think um, you know, coal-powered uh, power plants still is a very uh, economical solution for many poor developing countries, although we all know it's, it's right. polluting out there. So, uh, so I think that's a very significant development. Uh, and uh, I think over time, the if you look at the total energy uh, source in China, okay. currently coal stands at about 60 percent. I think that the, the ratio is going to continue to go down in the, in the future. OK, and we have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.